Hello, today I want to talk about the breakthrough, the takeoff of industry in the 1850s. And takeoff is a, is a technical term that economic historians use to describe that time period when industry goes from being one sector of the economy to being the economy, where everything becomes tied into an industrial manufacturing process somehow, or into the capital flow that is essentially originating from industry or passing through industry. So you're going from a society that has some industry to an industrial society. And this happens in the 1850s in the United States, France, Germany, and to some extent, parts of Italy, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russia, Sweden, etc. But the core countries where this process takes really, really takes off in the 1850s is Germany, France, and the United States. And of course, Britain had gone through this earlier in the 1830s. So um, you're now approaching an industrial world system. When before that, you had Britain being the industrial country, the United States, France, and Germany catching up. Now they, ha they are catching up, they are caught up. <clears throat> and of course, that means now you get competition and you get internationalized capital markets. In other words, a system that starts to resemble pretty much what we know today, except based on steam <clears throat> propulsion and not the um, modern communication technologies and the internal combustion engine and so forth. So um, what is taking place during this time period? It is not just a question of technology, although technology has something to do with it. And it's not just about manufacturing. There are multiple processes that play out on three planes, the production of things, their transportation, and their consumption. And um, all of that, all three steps entail changes that are technological, legal, economic, cultural, social, and so forth. So I'm gonna try and make it as uh, painless and quick as possible because it's a lot of ground to cover. First, if we consider um, the production process, here, the importance of technology is especially evident. But that is not to say that technology is all that matters here, because after all, people have to get accustomed to using that technology that's a social and cultural process. But the revolution here is about three things. Um, how power is generated, what materials are used and processed, and what kinds of things um, are made for the market. In other words, what kinds of commodities are produced. Um, next, in the transportation um, field, in the field of transportation, there are, there's a transportation revolution going on. In fact, there is a book with that title, The Transportation Revolution. Um, and of course, if you're going to mass produce, you can do that for a local market. So you need to have a national or better yet international transportation system where you can quickly and cheaply get lots of product to the consumers after you've saturated your local market. And in pursuit of that, a combination of efforts by government and private investors and tends to go back between <clears throat> government doing these things and private investors doing them into roads, canals, and railroads in that order as the technology becomes available. And finally, in the field of consumption, there is a market revolution. Likewise, the title of a book on the subject where you have on different regional, um, at, at different regional levels, uh, different things going on. In the countryside, you have the emergence of this mom and pop country store, which stocks goods, even though it looks quaint to our eyes, it stocks goods that come from a global uh, interconnected network of industrial uh, production and transportation. 
in the big cities, the novelty, the department store, which is both a space for cultural expression and it tries to redefine how we even think about markets. And finally, financially and transportation by the globalization of markets. So if you're talking about globalization, if you're talking about a world economic system, 1848 really is the time when people for the first time were able to, to theorize that. If you read the Communist Manifesto, that is precisely what this is about. Um, that is the main insight here. The, in, the universal interconnectedness of the world due to everybody's engagement in this market exchange that tends to take a global scope uh, on its own. So um, let's go into the details here. Production. There are more types of things that can now be made in industry and more of them. So before that, really, in the first phase of industrialization, textiles was it. You had machines that wove cloth from yarn. And you also had machines that made the yarn and that combed the wool eventually. But it really was about textiles. In the United States, one of the dirty secrets about that connection between industry and agriculture, especially the free market industry in the north and the slave labor agriculture in the south is that a whole lot of the fabric of the textiles made in northern factories ended up being purchased by southern slaveholders as cheap clothing for their slaves. Um, so the quality of industrially mass manufactured textiles was such that it was precisely for these types of um, customers who were not in fact making their own purchasing decisions. Also uniforms for armies, etc. Um, and so in the 1850s, that changes. It is no longer just about textiles. Suddenly it is very much about metalworking. Coal, iron ore, um, together with limestone made into steel, and then the steel made into all kinds of things from um, lamp posts and pipes to pipe industrially manufactured gas into a network of gas lights in a city or rails or railroads or steam boilers for power generation, either stationary or mobile. So all of this new technology of the 1850s is sophisticated. You, don't, you may not think of steam power as something sophisticated, but it, it sure is uh, compared to what they had before. It is also very expensive. Um, that means that if you want to buy a steam boiler to power your factory or your railroad, or if, and even more so if you want to build a factory that makes steam boilers, you're going to have to go beyond the family, the merchant family that used to be able to finance ventures, and even beyond the city where a local class of merchants used to be able to swing those things, and you really have to tap into a national or international capital market and there sell stocks, sell bonds to people all over the map. Um, so that alone means that you have, if anything were to happen in that system, if any crisis occurs, the ripple effect is going to be global. Um, so if a, if a railroad company in Pennsylvania goes bankrupt, that might mean that a school teacher in Southern Germany loses his life savings. So here is an illustration to how power generation changed. Um, now the picture on the left by the quaint mill run uh, looks bucolic, but really it isn't. If you've ever been inside one of these factories, it's loud and nasty. Um, so just because the, the power generation is from water, it doesn't mean it's somehow a more pleasant working environment. And on the right-hand side, of course, we have a steam-powered factory. So uh, what does that mean in practical terms? It emancipates industry from a limited choice of locations. Because if you want water power, you have to have a sufficient flow of water year-round over a height differential that is high enough to generate the energy that you need to power all your factories. 
And there aren't many places. It's usually where the foothills end and the coastal plains begin. So there is Lawrence, Massachusetts, which is exactly there on the Merrimack River, um, where that description applies. There is Jones Falls in Baltimore. There are places north of Philadelphia. Um, and there, there aren't that many else. Manchester, the industrial city in England, where textile manufacturing really takes off at first, also is at the edge of the Pennines, these mountains. So they also have their water supply. Plus, just like with Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, which is where Lawrence is located, Manchester has Liverpool, which is a merchant city. That's where the capital comes from. The merchants from the city finance industry to take over not just the handling and shipping, but the, the very production of the things that they make their money with. So all of these are um, in their own right revolutionary processes. Now with the addition of steam, however, um, you do now need not just a supply of water, but also of coal. But given that, and once you have railroads that can ship coal places, you are a whole lot more mobile as to where you can put your factories. And so by the 1880s, you can actually plunk down a factory in a field in the middle of Indiana um, and build a company town and hire people to live there, regardless of whether or not you have um, you know, a stream nearby. You don't need the water power. Um, on the top right, you have a picture of a textile factory right around the 1850s. This is in the National Park in Lawrence, Massachusetts that I mentioned. And when they have these machines running, it is deafening. You can't hear your own word. So nevertheless, um, one thing I want to point out is you see the... Uh, the rod that is running along the length of the hall underneath the ceiling. And not the air vent, but the rod right above the machine's top right. Um, that is a, oh, um, gee, I'm blanking on the technical term in English. Um, it's a thing that, that rotates around its own axis. It conveys the power. So on one end, you have the mill wheel or the, um, the belt that drives this rod. And then feeding off um, the kinetic energy. There are belts that run off the rod on the ceiling and to the, um, to the machines. You see the belts running from the ceiling to the machines. So that's how power is distributed. Um, of course, once you switch from water to steam power, you really all ha only have to do one thing, which is to disconnect the water wheel on one end of that rod and replace it with a steam, um, power source. So the next big step for power distribution within the factory will be electricity, but we're not there yet. <coughs> now in the bottom left corner, there you see a, um, a puddler at work. This is somebody who mixes the ingredients for steel in these humongous buckets, and then they're poured into forms, um, into molds to make whatever you want to make from that sheet metal, um, beams, rails, um, and so on and so forth. In a way, this is actually a more um, skilled process, the steel making is, than the textile manufacturing that is already mechanized. This puddler who's standing there needs to be almost like a wizard in his knowledge of materials. Steel is ancient. You might have heard about a thing called the sword that has been around since the earliest prehistory of humanity. As soon as people were able to make that, they did, just so that they could, you know, attack others with it. Um, you might have heard about King Arthur, the legendary British king or English king, who drew a sword from a stone and thus became king of England. Well. The, the rational background of the legend appears to be plausibly that this guy was in fact, or it's a metaphor for, for steel making. If you are going to cook up a batch of steel for a sword, um, 
and you, you're going to be doing that in a stone vat. So you're literally drawing the sard from the stone, you're molding it into sharp, sard shape in some kind of stone mold, uh, and that's probably what that story is about. And that, uh, to, to the uninitiated, that looks like magic taking place. So what you see here is this is not something new, it's just that it's scaled up and um, the uses of steel are expanded many, many times. Including, of course, to affect a part of the economy that we consider separate and, and different from industry, agriculture. American agriculture in particular, where you have the Great Plains just getting plowed for the very first time in the 1850s, um, moving on westward from Chicago, that is an industrialized process. If you really want to run your, your farm competitively, you have to use this kind of machinery and the McCormick factory starts in 1847 to make these automated reapers. First um, to use with a team of horses and then also with their own steam power setup. You see there the um, what looks like an oversized tea kettle that drives that tractor. Um, and that is an 1850s picture you have there. So um, agriculture, if agriculture is affected to this degree by industry, if it becomes an extension and, an, and dependent on industry, you can tell that clearly this is now an industrial society, not just a society that happens to have some industry. So what happens as a, result of this industrialization. First, remember in the 1820s, the poor in the cities um, whose children ended up in the house of refuge and who joined gangs of New York and all that, these were paupers. Paupers, that's a technical term that describes an urban working class that has no work for structural reasons. They've been kicked out of the master's household. They've been kicked off the farm. But industry hasn't grown to the extent that they would need them as wage workers. So they literally have nowhere to go. Nobody needs them, the excess population. And they're not doing well. Now, as industry starts to hire, the paupers disappear and turn into an industrial proletariat which doesn't mean that their lives change and improve that dramatically, but it, not, it means that now they're no longer poor because there is no work for them, but now they're poor because they're working in industry. Um, <clears throat> but it does change their culture and their consciousness because there is a growing awareness among this group of people that everything that exists, all the marvels of our modern life and society, the gas lights, the railroads, the steamships are the product of their labor. They are the creators of this marvelous new age of industrial technology. There is also a sense that economic interdependence is now a fact, that people are no longer self-sufficient, no matter how much they would like to live in isolation no matter how they would like to shut out the influence of foreign ideas, immigrants, goods that come from someplace else and undercut prices here. There is simply no way back to local self-sufficiency. And for better or worse, as soon as you decide, I am going to put, participate in a capitalist free market, you are going to have to deal with the anonymity of the forces that shape your chances in life. The price, the wage, all that, a whole lot of that is no longer, can't be under your control because you're working in a global system where, like I said before, if a railroad company goes under in Pennsylvania, it might mean that you, as a school teacher in Southern Germany who's never taken a train in his life, is suddenly going to be um, living an impoverished life in retirement. And third, another economic slash cultural consequence is universal commodification. This, the sense that everything can be bought and sold. And that too is a cultural 
thing. People come to increasingly look at everything <clears throat> in terms of its market value. And of course, many people bemoan that and say this leads to a loss of morals. Um, and yet, it is already implied the very first moment you step off your subsistence farm or out of your craft workshop and you decide, I am now going to participate in a free market where goods are being bought and sold as commodities. Um, of course, one part of this alienation of goods from their specific users and their producers has to do with the fact that um, you kind of lose track of where stuff comes from. There used to be a time when it was clear who, boke, who baked the bread you, you bought, who harvested the grain that went into the bread, who, who milled the grain into flour and so forth. Nowadays, and I've used this example before, if you take a quick look at your cell phone or even at the machine that you're watching this video on, it contains parts that are from every conceivable corner of the world, put together by labor in every conceivable corner of the world. The one thing that is clear is it all comes together um, in the portfolio, in the stock portfolio of some person in, uh, in, in New York, um, possibly in London, in a, in a center of capital. Um, but the labor, uh, and the materials that go into this machine that you're using is, is a global um, mishmash. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, ever stand a chance of meeting you know, the, the kids who were forced into, into labor in the mines for rare earth minerals uh, in the Congo, uh, like I said. Um, in, in, in mining, in, in, in producing the materials that went into it. And of course, part of why this becomes possible is that you have a transportation network that transcends these local limitations. So at the same time, it is a loss. You, you no longer are familiar with the people and the products that they make. You have no personal connection to the stuff that you buy from the store. Um, on the other hand, you now can get your hands on things from all over the place. Um, uh, for heaven's sake, I'm getting the, the coils from my, from my vape thing here straight from Beijing by mail. You know, it takes a week. Um, I can watch German opera on YouTube whenever I want. Um, any production of any conceivable opera, um, at least an excerpt. So the expansion of the possibilities is, is dizzying. On the other hand, um, this is also disconcerting. Like there's a backlash from the earliest moment on where people say, do we really want these Irishmen in our town who are building the canals, who are building the railroads? Um, aren't they bringing disease? Aren't they, bring, aren't they subverting our democracy with their benighted Catholicism, with being beholden to the Pope who might tell them how to vote in our elections? So, um, this globalization and the backlash against it, which is usually about race, religion, ethnicity, go hand in hand from day one. And one of the reasons to put it bluntly is you, you're not able to influence as a, as a single individual, especially if you're not willing to, to theorize and go up against the market itself. Um, you're not able to influence the wage, the price, uh, the cost, and the free market. These are anonymous forces. What you can, however, do, even though it doesn't do you one bit of good, you can take a shovel and whack an Irish immigrant over the head. Um, and if you think that it is somehow his fault that your business isn't doing well, or that your country is going to the dogs, then that might make you feel better, except it also has literally no effect on your ability to, uh, to do better in your business or in your job. So but this, this starts in the 1840s. I'm gonna take a break now for part
to part two.